California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you feel that you're one against the world and the help you need must be discreet and confidential, call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, in this whole world, there's only one person I care about, my 12-year-old daughter, Penny. This Friday, I lose her, unless I can make her change her mind about me. You may be the one person who believe my side of the story instead of the juicy tabloid version everyone else chooses to believe. If this appeals to your, let's say, chivalrous side... To your, let's say, chivalrous side, I'll be home all day tomorrow. 19 Montclair Drive, Lakeside Heights. Signed, Barbara Ebersole. Barbara Ebersole? What do you know? What do you know? Barbara Lawson Ebersole. All right, so she has a maiden name. Hey, you know, I flunked medieval history in college because of this gal. You mean she wouldn't let you copy from her paper? <laughs> Nothing as intimate as that, Angel. You see, she was in a musical comedy, and it stayed in town for six weeks. Uh-huh. Matinees, Tuesday and Thursday, 2.30... Same time as my class in medieval history. Yeah, I know. You had a conflict. On my history exam, they asked me who sank the Spanish Armada. And the only name I could think of was Barbara Lawson, the most beautiful girl in the world. To quote the poster. And I thought you worked your way through college. Yeah, except on those Tuesdays and Thursdays. Brooksy, we're going to drop in on Barbara Ebersole, if just for all lang syne. <laughs> Uh, pardon me, young lady. Yes? The maid showed us in. We're looking for Mrs. Ebersole. She's my mother. She's upstairs, but she's probably listening to see if I'm practicing my piano list. Oh, so you're Penny. You know something. What's that, dear? I could play like this. <laughs> well, that's a great improvement on what we heard when we came in. That's the way she'd like to hear me play. But when she's in the house, I play like this. Real nice kid. I think so. Oh, Mr. Valentine? Oh, yes, Mrs. Eversole, and this is Miss Brooks, my assistant. How do you do, do Miss Brooks? Are these people here to take your pictures for the tabloids again? Penny. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I hate myself. I don't know if it's any use at all, Mr. Valentine. Even if the courts let me keep Penny, I can't make her love me. What is it that's so wrong between you and Penny, Mrs. Eversole? Her father. Her wonderful, irreproachable father who drove his car off the cliff a year ago. Oh, oh, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Why should you be? No one else ever was. I was the lucky one to have such a charming, attentive husband. Even his own child never suspected he was mean, cruel, and deceitful. No. That irresistible boyish smile took care of everything like that. I see. The last few months before he died, I started going out every night just to get away from him. And his indifference to whether I was dead or alive. And of course, everybody was saying... How can she do that to Jerry? Poor, charming Jerry. Uh -huh. Oh, you said your husband drove his car off a cliff. Somehow he doesn't sound the type. I'll never forget that night. We had the most bitter quarrel we ever had, and he stormed out of the house. Yes? Penny overheard us. Ever since, she's blamed me for what happened. Well, what's this about losing her on Friday? When Jerry died, his mother was determined to take Penny away from me. She almost did because Penny said she wanted to leave me. But the judge decided to put me... <laughs> On a sort of parole. One misstep and I lose my child because I'm an unfit mother. Uh -huh. Now I think I get it. That business about tabloids. That was the picture of you in the papers when you were brought up on a, a traffic charge. You don't have to be so charitable, Mr. Valentine. They called it drunk driving. But I tell you, I was framed. Framed? I had dinner with Dan Edwards. I swear I had nothing stronger than coffee. Next thing I knew, I was alone in my car on the side of the road. And there was the policeman. Oh, who is this Dan Edwards? I met him a short time ago. It was fun. We went out a few times, and then, well, this thing happened. Well, certainly this Mr. Edwards can explain you weren't drinking, that you were ill or something. Seems the little gentleman can't tell a lie. His version is that I had a little too much, created a scene in the parking lot at Club 44, and drove off without him. And you want me to prove it was a frame, is that right? I don't know how you're going to do it, but you must. And before Friday, Penny's all I got. I can't lose her. She'd go on thinking of me as a... Oh, Mr. Valentine. Oh, now, Mrs. Ebersole, don't. Two days isn't an awful lot of time, Mrs. Ebersole, but I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. 
I won't be hypocritical, Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks. I'm glad this thing happened to Barbara. Mrs. Eversole, isn't that a pretty harsh thing to say about your daughter-in-law? I told Jerry he should never have married a girl like that. Now, Mother, Barbara was Jerry's wife. And you're his brother, Leonard. You should be glad we're getting Penny away from this woman on Friday. Oh, we've heard so much about your son, Jerry. Yes. When Jerry walked into a room, the other men there stopped existing. You could tell that just by looking into the eyes of every woman. Yet he was kind and gentle... And when he smiled... Yes, we've heard all about that smile. I can understand your skepticism, Miss Brooks, but Mother's quite right. My younger brother was admittedly perfect. Mrs. Eversole, I just dropped in to tell you I'm playing on Barbara's team. Young man, you're wasting your time. There's no other explanation for what happened to Barbara that night, except the obvious one you'll find on the police blotter. I'm afraid, Mr. Valentine, my sister-in-law hired you to make her story sound a little more plausible. Could be... I'm going to have that child if it's the last thing I do. And I'm going to see that Barbara gets an even break if it's the last thing I do. Come on, Brooksy. Yes, George. Hey, look, Brooksy. How would you like to go to Club 44 tonight? I can recommend the food and the music's not too bad. Oh, I love it, darling. What time will you pick me up? You're going to be there alone. Alone? Well, not exactly. If I've got the right slant on this thing, you'll be with Dan Edwards most of the evening. Dan Edwards? Uh Uh-huh. I'll be waiting at Barbara's for your call. Well, what am I supposed to do? Mostly be your beautiful self, Brooksy. But to be more specific, here's the deal. Oh, I declare, Mr. Edwards, I'm just dreadful. I mean, being here alone in a nightclub in a big city with a strange man. Not a strange man, Claire. Just a lonely man. Oh, oh. When Ed Wander, the head waiter, told me that you were here all alone, I... I couldn't resist coming over to your table and introducing myself. And I wouldn't have it any different, Mr. Edwards. It's... it's Dan. Yes, Dan. Oh, I wonder what Daddy would say if he could see me now. Daddy? He's always saying, Claire, honey... People with our position and money have to be mighty careful whom they meet. Oh, and he's so right. Would you believe it? I slipped out of the hotel after Daddy and Mother went to bed. Aren't I just awful? <laughs> Let's compromise and say you're the sweetest thing that ever walked into my life. Oh, damn you. And I'm going to find out a lot about you. What your Daddy does, that great big house you must live in. Yes, damn you. And I'm going to find out a lot about you, too. <laughs> Not just practicing tonight, eh, Penny? Oh, Mr. Valentine. Anyway, she can't hear me. She's in her room, and the door is closed. Uh, Penny, you love to play the piano, don't you? Yes, when I'm alone. Well, tell me something, Pie Face. Who started you taking piano lessons? She did, and made me practice every day, whether I wanted to or not. Now you love to play, but not when she can hear it. Now that's kind of cockeyed, isn't it, kid? Well, I... I don't have to talk to you. I'm going up to bed. Where's my book? Hmm? Oh, that's it? Yes, let me have it. Your book, Denfield College, 1933. Yes, my father's picture is in there. I'll show you what they say about him. Here. Doesn't he have a wonderful smile? Mm. Listen. Ebersole, Jerry, most popular man on the campus. Captain, water polo team. Most likely to succeed. Yeah, that's all right. None of the others had things like that written about him. Look at the very next one under Father's picture. Eggleston, Frank, campus clown. Good old Eggie. <laughs> See what I mean? Eggie the clown. <laughs> oh, it's good to hear you laugh, dear. Oh, I was just going up to bed. Penny, wait. Good night. Never mind. Did you find out anything, Mr. Valentine? No, no, but I did want to know a little more about this Dan Edwards. Well, he introduced himself and said he was a friend of Jerry's at Denzel College. Yeah? He told me about the time just before he and Jerry were supposed to graduate. Jerry stole the clapper out of the chapel bell. Oh. Leonard had to square things with the dean and make sure his mother never found out. I see. Mr. Valentine, there was nothing wrong with my going out with Dan. For a year, I kept myself cooped up in this house, trying to be the perfect mother. Always remembering Judge Blanchard saying, one misstep, Mrs. Ebersole, and Penny goes to her grandmother. 
And having dinner with Dan once in a while sort of helped take the pressure off. That's huh? right. I can't think of any reason Dan would lie about what happened that night. But what did you find out about him? Not much, Mrs. Ebersole, not much. But I have an idea that even at this distance, I'm learning more and more about Dan Edwards every minute. <laughs> Well, tell me, Claire, what would it take to impress your, um, daddy? Well, like I keep saying, Daniel, he judges everybody by the substantial people they know. Well, I know some pretty important people in this town. You do? Yes. I advise them on their investments, help them spend their money. Here, just look at this check. Oh, my goodness. $5,000. Agnes Ebersole. Oh, I'm afraid the name wouldn't mean anything to daddy. Old Mrs. Ebersole. Her family stands for just about everything in this town. I didn't know you were so clever, Daniel. Oh, dear. Hmm? I've made up my mind. I'm going to call the hotel and tell Daddy I'm right here at Club 44 with a very respectable gentleman. He'll be proud to meet. Oh, thank you. Now, you stay where you are, honey. I'll be right back. <laughs> I got here as soon as I could, Brooksy. Edward's inside? Yes, Daddy. And I just bet Mr. Dan has got awful fidgety in there. All right, all right. Are you sure <laughs> about that check? Yeah, I saw the signature. Agnes Ebersole. Oh, good. That's a break I didn't even hope for. Now go on back inside. Well, what are you going to do, George? Oh, that's the surprise, Angel. The question is, who is it going to surprise most? Dan Edwards, Mrs. Ebersole, or Barbara? <laughs> We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about an extra service. When you're on your vacation trip, you don't expect to find everything just as convenient as it is at home. But when you stop at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations, you can be sure all along your trip of restrooms that are spick and span. Folks have said that one of the things that makes a long trip more pleasant is knowing there are clean and tidy restrooms along the way. That's why these restrooms are cleaned thoroughly every day, inspected often, and well supplied with soap and towels. The men who offer you this service never want you to feel obliged to buy something when you stop. Just drop in any time at Standard Stations and Independent Chevron Gas Stations, where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Under what circumstances would you say a mother deserves to lose custody of her child? Well, Barbara Ebersole, ex-chorus girl, is almost certain to be declared an unfit mother, unless George proves that Barbara's recent front-page escapade was a frame-up. At Club 44 now, George makes his way toward the table where Claire is sitting with Dan Edwards, the man who seems to be the key to the whole problem. Hello, beautiful. I beg your pardon. Oh, now don't say you don't know me just because it happens to be true. Now, wait a minute, friend. Friend? Okay, prove it. Introduce me to the lady. Just you pay him no heed, Daniel, honey. Ah, uh -huh. a bell from Brooklyn. Mind if I sit down? Look, we don't know you, mister. Now, on your way. Please, Daniel, not here. What would Daddy say if he found out I was involved in a fuss? Why, the lady's absolutely right, sir. But I'll be glad to give you satisfaction out in the alley. Okay, smart guy, come on. Don't you hurt him too much now, Daniel, honey. Don't you think you'd better give me the name of your nearest of kin so I can notify him? <laughs> Okay, brother, how do we begin? You want to knock the chip off my shoulder, or do I just poke you in the nose? Stop the kid stuff. I've got a proposition to make. Now, what are you talking about? I'm working up a business deal with a young lady in there. I've, I've got to impress her. Now, what do you say you take this ten bucks and have yourself a time somewhere else? Forget the whole thing. <laughs> oh, come on, boy. Let's play rough. You're a big husky lad. Let's see if you can take care of yourself. Okay, I gave you your chance. No! Oh, what an opening. Hey, what do I have to do to make you sit down? Oh, that'll teach you to... Not to go around waving checks in front of you, ladies. Now, where is it? Yeah, here we are. $5,000. Mrs. Agnes Ebersole. Paid to Dan Edwards. Well, I wonder how she's going to explain this little payment. <laughs> Yeah, hello. George, what 
happened to you? I've been calling your apartment for an hour. I know, Angel. Just came in. I went out to see old Mrs. Eversole. Oh, then you got the check. What did she say? Nothing, because she wouldn't see me. Oh. But maybe it's just as well. She can explain it to the judge tomorrow. So see you in the office nice and early. Oh, and Brooksy. Yeah. Just wanted to say you did a smooth job with Edwards. Thanks. Oh, it won't. Nothing, honey. <laughs> Good night, chicka child. Not as smooth as you thought, Valentine. Now, what? How'd you get in my room, Edwards? I've been waiting for you to show up. Oh, maybe I underrated you, boy. You're quite a grim character when you're holding a gun. I could just ask you to hand over that check, but I'm going to do it the hard way, too. How's this for a start? <laughs> You said nice and early in the office this morning, and I... George! Now, no comments on my appearance, Brooksy. Let's just say I overslept with somebody's help. But... The I... important thing is I don't have that check anymore. Huh? Hey, wait a minute. Hello, Valentine. Yeah, Barbara? What's that? Well, when'd you miss her? Well, look, getting hysterical isn't going to help. Penny? Just a minute, Brooksy. Yeah, I have an idea where to find her. So stay where you are. I'll get in touch with you. <laughs> I'll see to that, Penny, dear. This is something you have nothing to say about, Mrs. Eversole. Can't you see, Valentine, it's better this way? You can call Barbara and tell her to meet us at Judge Blanchard's this afternoon. It's a foregone conclusion he's going to award Penny to us anyway, Leonard. I hate her, I hate her. I thought this might be the kind of stunt you'd pull, Penny. Now, here, look at me. I mean, straight in the eye. You know if you came to the judge with your grandmother, your mother wouldn't stand a chance of keeping you. Now, didn't you? What about it? Just this. You're coming home with me. Grandma! Take your hands off her, Valentine. Young man, you're not the police, you know. And it's a good thing, Mrs. Eversole. You could be charged with abduction, trying to keep Penny here. And another thing. What have you got to say about a $5,000 check you gave Dan Edwards? What? I never issued any such check. Oh, I see we're going to have to play this right out to the end. Come on, Penny. No, no, now, don't no! Don't give me any trouble, pie face. Because I've got a lot of things to do between now and 2 o'clock. Dean Bronson, young Jerry Ebersole was quite a big man here at Denfield College, wasn't he? Well, Mr. Valentine, he had one of those rare personalities that ingratiated him to everyone he met. Yeah, I know, that charming smile. That's right. Uh, wouldn't you say that the way he died, I mean suicide, was... Way out of character? Well, since you say this information is important to his wife, uh, the whole Ebersole family... You can take my word for that, Dean. I guess it's my duty to tell you there was a regrettable weak streak in Jerry's character. Oh, what do you mean? He forged quite a sizable check against the student body funds in his junior year. Uh -huh. Of course, his mother made good, and, well, we hushed it up. You know, the... Uh, family endowed the Eversole Library here at Dinfield. Yeah, thank you, Dean Bronson. You've been a great help. A great help. <laughs> Mr. Dunlap, Jerry Eversole was working for your brokerage firm when he committed suicide, wasn't he? Why, well, yes. He was one of our best contact men, Mr. Valentine. He made that episode personality go a long way. Well, I've heard enough about that. Let me ask you a simple, direct question. Yes? How much did Jerry Ebersole steal from your firm? What, what, what are you saying? I, I don't understand. There are two big reasons people commit suicide. One's love, the other's money. Everybody loved Ebersole, the personality boy. Now, how much money did he steal from you? I, I don't know how you ever found this out, Mr. Valentine. His mother made good. Oh, Grandma to the rescue. We never prosecuted. We... I do hope there won't be any publicity at this late date. The firm of Dunlap and Garrett is very conservative. How much was it? A shortage of $20,000 in his accounts. I see. I've always thought poor Jerry began to loathe himself so much he just couldn't go on anymore. That was the real reason for his suicide. You're a good psychologist, Mr. Dunlap. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Brooksy, I've made up my mind. I'm going to tell both Barbara and the kid the truth about Eversole. Where are they? Upstairs, getting ready to leave for Judge Blanchard. Oh, that's right. We don't have much time. George, we usually see eye to eye about things. 
But I think you're wrong this time. Penny's a sensitive, unpredictable child. You don't know what a thing like this might do to her. Well, it, it may just jar her enough to realize what she owes her mother. Or it may have the very opposite effect. All right, so it's taking a chance. Okay. But look, Brooksy, Peggy is young with a whole life ahead of her to get over any kind of shock. What does Barbara have left if they take a daughter away from her? Well... Oh, no, Brooksy. I'm going to tell them both what the score is before we meet the judge. And I'll need your help, just the way we worked it out. Barbara, we still have a few minutes, and the courthouse is only across the street. Yes? Well, there's something I must tell you. What's that, Mr. Valentine? Suppose we go into this little park and sit down. Penny wouldn't even walk down here with me. She insisted on walking with Miss Brooks a half a block behind us. What chance do I have? Let's wait and see, huh? Those chimes from the tower are there. They're beautiful, aren't they? Yes. What did you want to say, Mr. Valentine? I'd like to see the judge and get this over with. Please, Barbara. Those chimes. They make me feel like praying. And it's been such a long time since I've prayed. But there's only one thing I want. And... What I've got to say can wait, Barbara. Why don't we both just sit here and listen to the chimes for a while? Dear Lord, if I can't have Penny, let her be happy wherever she is. And, and if the only thing that will really make her happy is to forget that I was ever her mother, let it be that way, too. Amen. Barbara, this is what I wanted to tell you. I found out today why Jerry killed himself. What? He stole $20,000 from Dunlap and Garrett. Oh, no. That's the truth. And his mother covered for him, just as she did every other time he got into trouble. I don't believe it. You're lying, both of you. Penny, what's she doing here? I didn't know she... I'll never believe that about my father. Never. Please, Penny, wait. Wait. Oh, Mr. Valentine. I'm sorry. I thought if Claire brought Penny here... Well, whatever slight chance I had is gone. But it doesn't matter. Judge Blanchard's already made up his mind... Let's go and get the formalities over with. Penny, come here, dear. Yes, Judge Blanchard? The uh, last time we were together, about a year ago, I had to make the decision about you and your mother. Now it's up to you. I... I know. Don't be frightened, Penny. Tell the judge how you feel. Yes, Grandma. There's something I'd like to say, Judge Blanchard. Please, Mr. Valentine, what else is there to say? You can see the nervous state of this child. It'll be a crime to let her stay with her mother. Let Penny go on, Mr. Valentine. Okay, but I'm not through. Take it easy, darling. Penny, you're a sensible little girl. And you're old enough to know whom you'd like to live with. Well? Well, I... I... Don't be afraid to talk to the judge, Penny. I... I would like to... Go on. I want to go home and live with my mother. Oh, mother, mother. Oh, Penny. My baby. I... I heard what you said when you were over there in the park. That, that it would be better if I forgot all about you. If it would make me happy. Oh, now, hush, darling. That doesn't matter now. I... I kept thinking about it, and... Somehow I know what Mr. Valentine said about father is true. Oh, mother. Mother. It's been a whole year since you've called me that. Judge Blanchard, I don't know what came over Penny, but certainly we can't forgive this woman's scandalous behavior. Don't you dare talk about my mother that way. Penny, Penny what are you saying? Couldn't we go home now? Together, Mommy? Judge? I think you can decide the way your heart's telling you to, Judge Blanchard. And if we can have a few minutes alone, I think we'll even be able to satisfy the law. Yes, Judge Blanchard. 
Leonard hired Dan Edwards to have Barbara conveniently drugged that night. But what would be Leonard Ebersole's reason for doing anything like that? Well, the old girl was prepared to leave her entire fortune to Penny if she could get her legal custody. Leonard wanted to be in the position to administer the estate. After all, Penny doesn't come of age for nine years. But what about this check to Dan Edwards? You said it was signed by Mrs. Ebersole. Some fancy blackmail, Judge. When Edwards was through with Leonard, he started on his mother. The Ebersole. It's hard to believe. George, how did you suspect Leonard? Edwards never graduated from Denfield with Jerry. In the college yearbook, it was Ebersole and then Eggleston. No Edwards. Then who could have told Edwards about that little escapade Jerry had in his senior year? The one with the chapel bell. Well, that was all hushed up, Brooksy. The mother never knew about it. It had to be Leonard. Pretty good work, Valentine. You know, when I was district attorney, I would have had a job for you. Oh. Well, thanks. George may be able to return the compliment and have a job for you someday soon, Judge. I hope. Beg your pardon? Huh? Oh, of course, we could go to a church. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. I'll be more than glad to say the all-important words, Miss Brooks. Oh, wait a minute. Now who's getting framed? Come on, Brooksy. I'd be willing to bet there's not one car owner in a thousand who could lubricate his car thoroughly. For there are more than 20 vital wear points on the average car... And if most of us tried to find them, it would be pure guesswork. Even the expert lube men at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations don't rely on experience alone when they grease your car. Instead, they follow a precise lubrication chart recommended by the manufacturer of your car. And they use RPM greases and oils, each one tailor-made to protect those key wear points. Tailor-made, too, to smooth out shocks and give you easier riding. So for low-cost maintenance and better riding, get a lube job with RPM oils and greases every thousand miles at a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... George, the door isn't locked. Yeah, wait a minute, Angel. Put the light on. <gasps> George! Well, they couldn't have done a better job in this room if they used a bulldozer. Mr. Karofsky! Mr. Hey, Karofsky! Hey, don't be naive, Brooksy. They didn't make rubble out of this place just for exercise. Yeah, they gave Karofsky this little party and took the guest of honor away with him. George! Oh, come here, look. Huh? Oh, yeah. Blood. They couldn't wait, could they? Oh, but he's such a... Such a little man. We're up against a racket that thrives on little people, Brooksy. And we're going to keep at it until we find out what it is. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Virginia Gregg as Barbara, Don Bender as Penny, Noreen Gamil as Mrs. Ebersole, Stan Waxman as Leonard... Jay Novello as Edwards, and Herb Butterfield as Judge Blanchard. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.